<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Uh, hello, this is uh, Porrick here from the Irish Wildlife Trust, and uh, you're all very welcome. I see a few people entering uh, into the the webinar, um, so um, I'll just I'll just give the introduction while people are are coming in. Uh, we're holding this webinar from uh, Glasgow in Scotland, where no doubt you're aware that the Conference of the Parties, this 26th Conference of the Parties, the COP as it's called, uh, is underway uh, across the River Clyde here in the, uh, in the event centre and has been going on since Monday. And uh, it's been getting an enormous amount of media attention, which is very, very welcome. Uh, and there's quite a substantial contingent of um, people traveling from Ireland to the COP. Um, and I thought it would be uh it will be interesting and uh, to, to find out, uh, to hear from some of those people about uh, the kind of uh, uh, things that will be going on at the COP or the kind of expectations we have for it uh, or why people are even uh, traveling to this uh, in, the, in the first place. Um, I've been here since Monday. This is my first uh, time coming to an event of this kind of a scale. Uh, and I have to uh, say, you know, today was was beginning to get a feel for what was happening today. But at that stage, all the world leaders had gone home. Uh, but it's going to go on for another two weeks. Um, and, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm still trying to navigate my way through the scale of it. There's absolutely thousands of people here. Um, the event center itself is, is spread over a number of different areas. And there's people milling around around uh, all over the place. And then of course, there's lots of things happening outside the event center as well uh, that we're trying to keep an eye on. And in particular, there's an enormous um, climate march happening this uh, Saturday that's gonna happen in other cities around the world as well. And there is the uh, school strike, which is happening on Friday as well, which is going to be pretty, pretty big. Uh, so there's an awful lot happening and, and sometimes, you know, you're trying to figure out what is what really is happening. And, uh, you know, so hence I've invited along uh, some people this evening to help us uh, decipher uh, the tea leaves, uh, if you want to mix my metaphors. And I'll just do a, a quick uh, tour around of some of the great uh, luminaries of, uh, of Irish <laughs> academia and NGOs that we have here. Um, we have Sive O'Neill, who is a lecturer in climate policy policy at Dublin City University and a member of the DCU Centre for Climate and Society and she's a former coordinator of Stop Climate Chaos and has been to a few of these cops before but we'll get to that later. Uh, we have Professor John Sweeney who is a, uh, has been a lecturer at the Geograph Geography Department at NUI Maynooth, he's Emeritus Professor since 1978. So John will tell us a thing or two about a thing or two I imagine uh, about cops in particular. Um, he's been a contributing author uh, to the the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, and he's a member of Antashka's Climate Change Committee. Uh, we have Siobhan Curran. Hi, Siobhan. Thanks for coming in. You're, you're definitely in Glasgow. I can see the, the glowing globe behind your head. Uh, Siobhan is head of policy and advocacy with Trocra and has worked in the area of human rights and gender equality for 15 years and uh, previously coordinated the Roma program in Pave Point Traveller and Roma Centre and worked in women, peace and security with Amnesty International. Uh, and we have a uh, Tad Kirikovsky, uh, who is from Voice uh, Ireland, and uh, Voice is an Irish environmental charity that empowers individuals and local communities to take positive action to conserve our natural resources. So thank you all so much uh, for for coming, and. Um, I suppose I might just do a quick tour around uh, all of you who are here, and maybe I'll, I'll start uh, with yourself, Siobhan. Can you explain to people why you're, you're, you've travelled uh, to Scotland for, for this enormous event? You know, we're one of 26,000 people, I think. You know, why are we here? Yes, thank you, Porik, and um, hello, everybody. And I hope there's no too much uh, action behind me. Um, Only a I... rotating globe, Siobhan, that's all right. <laughs> that's it. yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, yes, I suppose for Trocra, we really want to be here to hold the Irish government accountable and to be part of the civil society uh, movement that are, that are letting our world leaders and decision makers know that we're watching. Um, that we see this issue as critical 
um, and that we really want to see actual progression uh, and firm commitments on the issues. Um, and really our um, you know, key for Tropra is that climate justice is at the heart of climate action. Um, so it's a critical cop from that perspective. I think overwhelmingly from uh, the least developed uh, countries and from developing countries across the world, uh, you can hear um, a coherence around uh, key issues that they feel need to be addressed this cop, you know, from loss and damage to climate financing. The message is, is loud and clear. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of, we're, we're here to do as much as we can to support and act in solidarity with those asks. And uh, Siobhan, I believe this is your first uh, COP. So, I mean, how is your experience? This is day three. How has your been experienced so far? Yeah, well, what you said there very much resonated with me. I, I feel like I'm finally getting to grips with where things are and what's going on. And as you say, the world leaders are gone. Um, I, I found, I mean, I'd love to hear what other panellists think. Um, because this is my, my first COP and I've been at other <laughs> treaty negotiations Um. Uh, namely the, the UN Treaty to Regulate Transnational Corporations, which has been negotiated in the UN in Geneva. And um, at, that's the very contentious space. But at the same time, um, civil society are at the table where you're uh, observing meetings. There's opportunities to speak truth to power um, and the interaction between those that are making the decisions and those affected by them is it's very um is is throughout the negotiations is there so that's i've observed that in the cop it's very different i've heard this is the been marked as the least inclusive cop in 10 years um and it certainly feels that way so um which is just absolutely um i mean like yeah no words to express how disappointing that is considering Climate justice has been so key to climate action uh, and for people to feel they're not, uh, you know, participating in a way that's inclusive is totally unacceptable. Um, so that's, yeah, so that is just some some initial thoughts. Um, and I mean, the, the other being, I suppose, uh, listening to the, the leader's statements, trying to... Um, I think the key thing will be, you know, what does this mean in practice and what are the actual commitments that are being made? Because uh, I think it was at the CAN press briefing earlier and they were saying, you know, lip service uh, will, will not get us anywhere. So I suppose, yeah, the real, the devil will be in the detail and that, that would be key to, to, to establish over the next two weeks. Yeah, yeah, very good. And and certainly you raised a few points there that I might come back to later. Um, John, um, I mentioned you're a bit of a veteran. Uh, can you can you maybe um, uh, let us know how many cops have you been to uh, in your career? And, and how is this one uh, uh, lining up for you? Well, I think this is my 10th cop. And um, <clears throat> I think uh, I'd, I'd agree with um, everything Siobhan was saying there. Um, it's the least transparent, it's the least open COP that I've experienced. And um, I think, you know, in previous COPs, uh, civil society was encouraged or even certainly entitled to wander into the plenary sessions that were open to hear what um, the, the various people were saying from the, the different countries. We never got involved in negotiations, of course, and we were never in the inner sanctums where the negotiations actually took place. But there was an openness uh, for civil society, which is missing here. And of course, the excuse that's being used is the COVID excuse, um, where limitations supposedly are existing all over the place now due to COVID. Um, so for example, today, um, despite wandering into the press room for the past three days, uh, I was turned away and told that we're no longer allowed in the press room, um, in the media room rather. <clears throat> um, we weren't allowed into the plenary sessions without a ticket. And uh, the only tickets that were being given out um, up until today, at least, were for the party officials themselves. So uh, there was there's an element of uh, of not really um, treating fairly, I think, civil society coming out of this COP, um, which is quite disappointing. Um, we've all had uh, from our own government uh, um, an email tonight warning us of our obligations. Um, that we are not allowed to say anything uh, in, our, in the capacity of our party overflow badges, um, that we have to expressly say we're not saying anything on the part of Ireland, which kind of rules out what civil society is all about, as Siobhan was saying, 
we're here to keep our eyes on what's going on from the negotiators that are acting on the behalf of the Irish public. So that, that's a bit disappointing. Um, I think the, the other aspect that's different here uh, is that the, the arrangements for entry are not working very well at all. Um, this is re relatively reminiscent of Copenhagen for me, where I queued for eight hours for two days once to get into uh, the COP. And um, uh, I, I, I did queue for an hour and a half for two days this week already. Um, but what's been happening is that people have been arriving at nine o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. And you have to, first of all, show your lateral flow test to get in the gate at all. Uh, it has to be on your phone and uh, on the NHS website, uh, you have to upload it to. And then once you get in, you join a massive queue of people queuing up to get into the security area where your metal detectors and so on. And that's the log jam that has emerged. They are not able to handle the crowds that are turning up. So uh, there's one of these, the things I object to mostly in airports, these ribbons zigzagging, zigzagging all over the place. Uh, and you have to go through that carry on for about an hour before you get through. In and John, form. just in terms of uh, all of those cops you've been to before, um, there's obviously a sense of jadedness, I think, yeah. uh, which is understandable. But people have also said it's the only show in town. I mean, uh, is, pro is progress made at these events? Progress is often made on the last day. Um, you will very seldom hear anything coming out of the first week of a COP. Um, what happens is the, the leaders come uh, in a big show of publicity, as we've seen over the past couple of days. They make noble statements about what they're doing great for the world. Um, they never tell you what broken promises are. They never tell you what the reality of their increased emissions are. <clears throat> and then they go away and they leave things to their, to their um, underlings, if you like, to negotiate on their behalf. And of course, the, the, the public officials often will come to the point where they won't make a decision until the end of the second week when the minister or their boss arrives to sanction it. So you find that you're in a kind of a limbo <clears throat> after the first week until maybe Wednesday or Thursday of the second week. And then when the crunch comes, um, then progress can be made and it can be made quite radically. Mm. Um, but we have to we have to just be patient, I think, for the next week or so to see who will be willing to make concessions. Um, and the signs, of course, in the first week are that nobody is willing to make concessions. We've had a very disappointing um, initial um, offering from India. Uh, we've seen China which hasn't appeared at all at this COP in terms of a pavilion, for example. There's only um, a corporate, pavil corporate China pavilion, which is kind of a contradiction in terms if you think of China, but there's no glossy presentation of China at all. Uh, and of course the prime minister, the president didn't come either. So there are, there are people absent who are the key people in a sense, and that's quite disappointing. And we will have to wait to see how much concessions the people that they have sent will be willing to make uh, before the end of next week. Yeah, that's interesting. And and going around the various pavilions, uh, I've noticed that the Russia doesn't have a pavilion either. Uh, no. But even some of the countries that do have pavilions, uh, like Australia, uh, this pavilion, I believe, is sponsored by the fossil fuel industry. And, uh, you know, the Brazilian pavilion is full of beautiful pictures of the Amazon. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the pavilions themselves um, uh, do, do quite a bit of greenwashing on behalf of their governments. But Saev, um, you told me all so this is you, you've been coming to COPS since uh, Paris, and uh, of course that's six years ago now, and that was a great moment of optimism. You know, we we remember the big cheer in the hall when the the gavel went down on the Paris Agreement. Um, can you describe your experience of COPS since then, uh, and and what you expect from this one? Yeah, thanks, uh, Porik. I wasn't actually at Paris, but I've been at most of the COP since then and a couple of the intersessional meetings. And they would be like preparatory conferences held in June, usually in Bonn in Germany, where the headquarters of the Framework Convention um, Secretariat is. And um, it's taken me this long to kind of get my head around the processes. It's, it's very technical. But so, so when I came into the attending COP um, 
thing. I suppose I, I arrived at, at the point where things were getting very technical, as in operationalizing the Paris Agreement rather than negotiating the text. So the, the key thing about the Paris Agreement, uh, for anyone who's tried to read it, is that there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of very carefully uh, constructed um, sentences with mixtures of obligations and voluntary commitments and strange terms that don't really aren't really clear what they mean. Um, there's commitments to things like transparency, but how does how does that actually translate in practice? So for the for the time that I've been attending the COPs, I've been tracking the negotiations as best as I could um, around the, the Paris rulebook and particularly in relation to carbon markets. And that's the one area of the, of the Paris Agreement that hasn't been finalized yet. So there's a big push to get it uh, sorted out um, at this <clears throat> COP, because it's three COPs now that it's not you know, been finalized. But I can tell you, cut, cut to the chase, that reading the opening statements of the subsidiary body that is looking into this, um, that the speeches and the comments and contributions of most of the key parties here are pretty much exactly the same as last year and the year before. <laughs> There's no difference at all. So I don't see yet where that um, flexibility or change of position is going to come from. And, and it's a particularly important area because uh, for developing countries, they see it as an opportunity to unlock more climate finance. But on the other hand, it opens up the possibility for all kinds of dodgy carbon accounting practices and uh, a kind of a false attribution of mitigation outcomes that, that are then traded internationally on these secondary markets that aren't really attached to any, any, any real science and mitigation. I think we're all pretty clear at this stage what needs to be done. I mean, net zero is a pretty tough call. There isn't much room for maneuver in that. And wherever, where there is, is in the area probably of land use. And that's where a lot of the focus will be. But also we still have, and this is the thing, the process is very slow. So we're still dealing with some of the overhang from the Kyoto Protocol and the transfer of some of the credits from the Kyoto Protocol as clean development mechanism are still kind of floating around, not worth an awful lot, but they have the potential to undermine any new mechanism that might be uh, agreed upon um, <coughs> under, under Article 6. So there's a lot at stake to Article 6. It's, it's very important. On the one hand, we need an agreement to kind of set the rules, because in the absence of rules, you have a kind of voluntary market that is being run essentially by private actors and, um, and, and, and that are not under the supervision of, of the parties uh, or the COP. But at the so same I'm sorry time, to cut across you because hmm. this is what, what people probably uh, are wondering what you're talking about. But I think oh, what sorry. you're talking about is offsets. <laughs> All of this stuff that people are, you know, the companies, you know, they see net zero and they think they can basically buy their way out of uh, out of trouble. Um, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Well, actually, Article Six is more than just about offsetting. It does create. Um, it does establish a mechanism for offsetting, and that could include states offsetting uh, emissions against their NDCs, and it could also, so they could be buying or selling credits, but it also involves um, a mechanism to include private activity. Um, and it's very complex when you start including, you know, private companies' um, mitigation plans and offsetting in a national uh, report. And, and it, you know, to what extent does it change the whole picture? But it's also about trading in emission reductions between countries. So if one country overachieves, I'd, I'd love to see that happen, but it hasn't been happening. But if one country overachieves, it can theoretically sell those uh, surplus credits to another country. But if, unfortunately, that's created a kind of perverse incentive for some countries to set very low baselines and to uh, sort of make promises that they know they can overachieve in, in order to generate these surplus credits. So you can see that we're, we're kind of right back where we were with the Kyoto Protocol and the, the mechanism under Article 6 will probably be slightly better, but it still um, has the potential to do some damage, if not more damage. I, th I yeah. think what I've seen, just to add to it a little, um, you know, we in Ireland um, fulfilled our Kyoto obligation because the economy crashed. Um, and that was the only reason we actually met our obligation over the 2008 to 2012 period. 
But other countries which had large allowances and also who had economic problems, um, they had those huge allowances, which as Saib is saying, uh, they now want to redeem uh, against their future emissions. And this, although they aren't big, they have the potential to really destabilize um, the whole uh, move towards staying within 1.5 degrees. Uh, countries like Australia are in the vanguard <coughs> and, Japan, <coughs> and Japan in this case as well. And these are the countries that are digging their heels in. And uh, as I was saying there, you know, when I went to Paris, you could tell from day one that countries were there to do business. It was the first COP where we had a bottom-up approach and countries were willing to make pledges. Um, I haven't detected that at all um, in Glasgow so far. Um, as Sai was saying, countries are, are, you know, they're really just digging their heels in as to where they were before we started off. And um, what one of the, the indicators I think that, that, we, that I'm watching for anyway over the next few days is whether or not the COP as a whole welcomes the uh, IPCC report, the assessment report six, because for the for the for 24 of the 26 years, uh, the first thing virtually that the UNFCC did as a unit was unanimously welcome any IPCC report. But um, in Katowice, uh, four countries, Russia, um, Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States refused to welcome the 1.5 degree report, which actually they themselves had been part of commissioning at Paris, uh, and therefore it was only noted. Uh, and um, because the UN only can act unanimously, um, that was a, quite a snub in many ways to the science. And um, I'm watching very closely to see whether the sixth assessment report will suffer the same fate um, here in Glasgow. And it will be an indicator that there are still countries that simply don't want to do business, those countries in some cases that have really stayed away from Glasgow. I know it's quite um, it's it's quite galling, really, uh, when you when you think about it. Um, I'm going to go to you, uh, Dermot. Uh, you're en route to uh, to Glasgow at the moment, um, and you're you're coming from a, a more academic background. And um, can you give us an overview of uh, maybe I don't know if this is your first cop or if you've been to them before, um, or for, for what what are you expecting from us? Do you think um, the, uh, the the expectations of you know uh, meeting are one point five degree uh, commitment at Paris, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get closer to it at Glasgow. You're on mute there, Dermot. Nearly two months, uh, two years into, into the pandemic, I still can't uh, find the <laughs> unmute button. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, thanks, Boric. Yeah, as I'm actually joining you from Belfast, I am... Um, uh, for, for complicated reasons, uh, my journey has been delayed, and so I'm uh, arriving hopefully in Glasgow tomorrow. Um, but I am in uh, Belfast uh, this evening. Um, so I, uh, I've i been to two previous COPs and one intersessional meeting. So I went to Copenhagen and I went to Paris. Uh, and uh, so, if you like, I, I, I choose the, the big ones to, to, to go to, the, the significant ones. And I also went to an intersessional meeting in China, in Tianjin, in China, in October 2010, which was kind of in the wake of, of Copenhagen, uh, and, and was, was interesting because it was really China trying to put its best foot, foot forward and to redeem its international climate reputation in the wake of Copenhagen, in which um, certainly in the Western media, China had been portrayed as, as the spoiler. And so, so it's interesting to hear, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not there in Glasgow yet, but to hear that China's footprint is, is, is very small. You know, obviously they haven't sent um, a president or, or prime minister. Their NDC was submitted in the middle of the night. Um, uh, and, you know, I, for, for anyone expecting concessions from China, I, I don't see any, I, you know, I think China has set its full and final position for um, for Glasgow on, on the table. I, I think it would be extremely unlikely for China to, to make any significant con concessions because that's not how the Chinese decision-making system works. They, you know, they 
they agree their position in advance. You know, this was the misunderstanding of China in advance of Copenhagen that there would be room for a maneuver over the two weeks of, of COP15 and, and it didn't come to pass. And I, I think the same is likely to be uh, the, the, the case um, in, in, in Glasgow, you know, which is problematic for, for the overall uh, outcome um, uh, because of the, the share of, of global emissions that uh, the China um, that the, the, uh, China is accountable for, um, but I, uh, I I guess coming coming back to you know the, the, the overall question of of expectations from Glasgow or, or what what I'm interested in I, I'm particularly interested in the interaction of the, the international domestic levels so climate policy um, at at the international level and and at the domestic level and. Um, in, in, in a, I wrote a piece for RT Brainstorm last week in which I said there, you know, there are basically three parallel but interrelated parts of, of any COP. There's the, the high-level political segment, which uh, you know, we saw on, on Monday and Tuesday. There's the technical negotiations, and we've heard um, you know, interesting discussions so far in, in this webinar about, about aspects of, of, of that. And then there's the, the broader ecosystem. There's the, 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 the side, side events, there's the 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 workshops the the seminars and you know it, if if I'm honest that's part of why I'm going you know it's it's kind of the, the Woodstock of climate change you know the, there's just an awful lot of really interesting stuff going on and really interesting people so that's part of my reason for for, for going but also in that wider ecosystem is the mobilization it's it's the activism it's, it's the the protests and it's it's civil society holding governments to, to account, as, as Siobhan said, said earlier. Um, but that happens not only uh, at the COP, it happens, um, you know, it, 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 you know the, 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 the climate march is going to be happening, I, I think, in different cities around, around Ireland and in different places in, in, in the world. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in how the, um, how, how what go, go, goes on in, in a COP interacts with um, wider political systems, and, and you're know, looking at it from that perspective. I, I think you begin to think about success or failure in, in slightly different terms. So you know, it, it may be that the uh, the negotiations on Article Six, as Sai was saying, you know, remain stalled, and and there isn't a breakthrough. But even you know, and I've seen a lot of commentary on on Twitter about this in the last few days. The the step up in an Irish context in terms of media coverage of of climate change. You know, I I don't think we would be seeing that absent from from COP26. So 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 I guess I, I think about um the impact of COP26 in a slightly different way. Um, you know, which which isn't to sugarcoat the fact that we're still way off track um, you know, in terms of, of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. But but you know, I I think something like this, uh, something like a COP does play an important role um, in um, kind of spreading the 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 message much further and and much wider and you know if we think about COP twenty six in in comparison to um, uh, COP fifteen Tara Shine was on Morning Ireland on on Monday I think it was you know talking about the, the her her reflections on participating in in Copenhagen uh, where you know her family and friends you know, didn't really know what she was going off to, to do versus now, um, you know, ev everyone is at least aware of, of, of COP26. So I think there's, you know, the, the, there's progress in those terms. Yeah, it's true. And and you wrote a very interesting piece for the Irish Times a couple of uh, days ago about this, uh, the framing of this meeting as a kind of a now or never moment as if, you know, if, if we don't come up with the goods next week, just, you know, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> we just stop dealing with climate change, which isn't really uh, the case, is it? Um, yes, and you know, I, I saw some comments on on Twitter saying, you know, kind of <laughs> explaining why people are framing it as now or never, and you know, and I completely get that, you know, and it, it, you know, this is this is a crucial moment, and um, I you know, I guess where I was coming from with in writing that article is is is, I guess a, a, a twofold fear. One one is that. Um, you know, everything wraps up, whatever way it turns out, everything wraps up on Friday or Saturday or Sunday next week, whenever it, whenever it finally comes to an end. And then everyone just goes home and, and goes back to, you know, their, their daily lives. Um, you know, governments, politicians, civil servants go back to everything else and, and climate change drops off the, 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 the radar. So, you know, I, I think keeping momentum after 
the cop is 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 really important but but i'm also yeah where, where i was coming from is is a fear that um that the outcome uh of cop demoralizes um people you know we we set it up to fail essentially if we say this is our last chance you know i i've a i've a book at home called published in 2006 called global warning the last chance for change change and um you know it's it's it, it feels like we're perennially stuck in the last chance saloon um and, and i and I, I just worry about um the 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 unintended consequences that might flow from from setting this up as our last chance and then we fail so that, yeah, I guess yeah. Right. yeah absolutely we're all in this for the long haul i think um Tad, uh, you're very welcome. And uh, Tad, do you want to tell us a little bit about Voice Ireland, what you do? And I know you're not yourself traveling to Glasgow, but some of your colleagues are. And um, as a small NGO, you know, I kind of feel that we in the Irish Wildlife Trust to be in the same category, you know, what can, what can a tiny organization like ours do in such an enormous event? And what, what are your expectations from COP and, and, and uh, how does your particular work area fit into what's being discussed? Yeah, well, First of all, thanks very much for having me here this evening. And uh, as you kind of said, two of our two of my colleagues, Lindsay and Abby, are on their way over there now, and so can't, aren't able to make it on here. And I suppose as a bit of background voice of Irish concern for the environment, we very much define ourselves around the twelfth SDG, sustainable consumption and production. And I think that kind you know that kind of focuses a lot of where we work. So it's a lot around waste and the circular economy in that area. And a lot of our work then is on, say, a community level. We work with communities and groups across Ireland. And so, as has been kind of mentioned by Siobhan and Dermot and pretty much everybody already, the importance of civil society being at events like COP to hold, hold governments to account both there and to show that show that we are there and that we are we find this important, but also afterwards to hold, to hold them to what they're saying there and to hold them and show that this is there is a continuing interest at a grass at a grassroots level as well. I think that's kind of those are the kind of the key reasons why we're there, but I suppose um, as well we kind of we work within say the waste kind of area. We are kind of typically viewed around kind of recycling and waste, but we very much define ourselves around the waste hierarchy. And the top of the waste hierarchy is prevention. And we've seen a lot like um, while waste and waste management only accounts for maybe three percent of carbon emissions, material consumption, material production and kind of the production of the things that we use accounts for about 55 to 65 percent and that kind of ties back into uh, the circular economy and circular economy approaches and so we kind of find that kind of a really important area to be there and to be there to be represented there and to kind of make those links between things like climate change and say the circular economy and how we use materials and i suppose then the kind of the third kind of aspect of it is that um the, the cop it's, it's a global it's a global event and increasingly production and production use and waste are becoming global uh, global chains and to make sure that there is the connection between the the items that are being made in one part of the world are being used for five minutes in a town in west cork and they are being found then on in another area of the world altogether and so like to, to make that link that these things are global chains and you know that we're kind of you're not acting in isolation in any of these things and so this is the kind of the importance of making sure that the items that you use, particularly packaging and things like that, are designed to be reusable where at all possible. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, the plastics industry really is a, is a, well, it's a, it is a subset of the fossil fuel industry, which isn't really appreciated yeah. a lot of the time. Um, and I was going to say, I think on. that's kind of a really important part of, say, the discussions at the moment, particularly when we're talking about decarbonizing the energy and the energy sector, we've seen, say, the plastics industry or the kind of petrochemicals industries have really ramped up and have ramped up their forecast for plastics production. And so then we have to kind of then look at that in terms of how we're using materials then and, you know, by kind of taking those those gases away from that, are we just shifting it and going to start kind of pumping out these other materials and are those materials being used appropriately? Are we managing them appropriately? Are we making sure that they are um, they are recyclable? When we say they're recyclable, can they be better used? Can we prevent that waste being used and created in the first place? 
Yeah, it's it's all it's all part of uh, of of the cycle, isn't it? Um, just to to everybody viewing in, just to let you know, uh, we we hope to have time for some questions at the end. So do please use the Q and A button if you want to type in your question, and if it's for anyone in particular, just just uh, say that uh, at the beginning. Uh, Siobhan, I want to uh, just go back to you, uh, please, because you mentioned um, a couple of things really to do with. Um, with the issues people are facing and and maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the the mood within uh the the global south uh, uh maybe the you know the the president of barbados gave quite a moving speech to the opening plenary really you know lambasting the rich countries for their broken promises um and so there's this issue of money but there's also this issue of access uh if you want to talk to us a little bit about the issues the, the big the macro and the micro issues maybe that developing uh, countries are facing. Yes, um, I mean, I think the, the speech by the uh, Prime Minister Barbados was, you know, the kind of encapsulated it all. And she talked about, um, you know, in our communities, the lack of climate finance is um, felt by, you know, loss of lives and loss of livelihoods. Um, so kind of really bringing it down to the, you know, the, the real, um, impact um and what was interesting about the world leaders speeches is that loss and damage was was only really mentioned by um you know states such as barbados and um i think it, all all the least developed countries um are, and those most impacted by climate change right now so uh for an issue that um you know that countries are demanding is put on the table and made that very clear I think it's disappointing then not to hear the richer countries um, even, you know, even mention it in their opening speeches. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the two issues that Trokra, apart from the overall issue of ambition, um, the kind of two key areas we wanted to focus on at this COP were uh, climate financing um, and then as part of that, uh, the need for loss and damage to be kind of a permanent agenda item at COP and for a commitment to this, a separate stream of finance uh, for loss and damage. Can you um, explain that a little bit, uh, Siobhan, what you mean by loss and damage uh, as opposed to the, the climate financing? So it's referring to the, the, the irreparable harm that's been done by climate. So situations where um, adaptation is no longer possible. So whether it's loss of life, obviously the, the most serious, um, but, but it, it would also cover, you know, damage to, to homes, to infrastructure, um, loss of, of biodiversity, of territories. So it's widening out as well. Um, and um, I suppose, yeah, the, the, the real sticking point, it seems, and I think others might know even more about this, um, is, is actually um, allocating or committing to a separate stream of finance for this. So it's um, important because of the finance, but also symbolically um, and to, to, to kind of separate it out. Um, and the, the other kind of area, or, or, or I mean, the, the broader, um, angle of that is climate financing itself um, and so th there was already a commitment to 100 billion dollars per annum uh, to be provided by 2020 by richer countries which hasn't been met um, and it's estimated by the OECD that 80 billion has been delivered um, and civil society organizations would say less Oxfam have done research on this um, and they're they're saying it's uh, difficult to, to quantify exact figures, but they're they're going a lot lower. I mean, a one estimation from twenty billion, um, and the issue is around um, what's been allocated as climate finance. But I think everybody agrees that there's a shortfall, um, and um, so I think out of this COP, two things that we're looking for: one is that there's um, a commitment to deliver on the shortfall, so that 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 gap is bridged. But also then that climate finance itself is um, the, the commitments are increased in line with the actual need. So I think a strong message from developing countries is this is nowhere where it needs to be. Um, and the, the UNEP in 2016 had estimated that it should be 300 billion dollars. Um, 
uh, so tripling of the, the current commitment and um, can uh, climate action network who are you know extremely active here and vocal have said you know um it, it will it will end up being much higher than that uh, into the trillions so i suppose um a real this is a cop that that we would hope that there's a grappling with the scale of the need um, and that an understanding as um you know the prime minister barbados was saying that this need is right now and promises for 20 years down the line don't help the person right now. Um, and, you know, I, I, it was interesting to hear Oxfam speaking at this at a press conference earlier uh, where they were saying, if you lose your home right now because of climate impact, the system doesn't support you. There's no help, you know. So, um, you know, talking about a 2050 target just seems too far off. And it's not to say we, we need those targets, but an understanding of um, the impact of climate change right now as well is needed. Um, and, and maybe the, the other issue is around um, quality finance and what it's directed towards. So, um, you know, there has been an overwhelming direction of climate finance to mitigation and approximately 20% towards adaptation. Um, and the, the, the importance of this is that people need um, finance be delivered in a way that helps them cope with the impacts right now and that's what adaptation uh, finance should be directed towards um, and you know one I mean certainly from Trocor's perspective we, we really believe that it's important that climate finance is overwhelmingly focused towards adaptation or certainly um, I mean some some of the advocacy is around at least 50 percent um, of financing towards adaptation um, that it's um, but it, that it's reaching the people on the ground who need it most, you know, the smallholder farmers, the fisher folk, um, indigenous communities. Um, and one channel for that is the Green Climate Fund, um, which has been really undercapitalized. And it's something that Ireland, um, as John has mentioned quite a lot, has given very little money to, only um, two million uh, in 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, this, the expectation is that the Green Climate Fund should deliver quality finance. And there are issues around how accessible that is and that needs to be improved. But I suppose the, the point being, the financing needs to go into uh, sustainable uh, projects that, um, you know, so for example, uh, sustainable agriculture through agroecological projects that are also transformative. Um, so, yeah, so I think more money needed uh, higher collective targets post-2025 and then quality and make sure it's reaching the people who need it most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and interestingly, I mean, some of the numbers you mentioned there might seem very big to people, but uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados did tell us how much Western governments basically printed from their money printing machines to deal with the with um, the economic crash and the uh, the um, uh, pandemic and all these things so the money I think can be it is available really it's it's not really an excuse uh, maybe, thanks, maybe um, sorry just one point on that the, it's it was estimated in 2020 that two trillion was spent on military spending so I think it's also a matter of priorities as well. I know it's shocking and it really brings the kind of the moral aspect of of, of all of this into sharp focus when we when we see the the, the amounts of money being spent on on militarism um, um, sh sh John I'm going to go to yeah. I come back to you John but sure. as Saev I know has to run out so I just wanted to get, get in uh, with Saev before she goes um, and uh, Saev I want I wanted to ask you what you thought of uh, the Taoiseach speech yesterday, and in particular the commentary, uh, you know, it, it, about the, the the methane pledge about reducing methane by thirty percent, and then coming out of the room and saying, "Oh yeah, we support it, but we're not going to do it," which kind of reminded a lot of us of, of what Enda Kenny did in Paris in twenty fifteen. <laughs> yeah, I'm not under as much time pressure as I thought actually, because Jeremy okay. tells me I won't get locked out, <laughs> but. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, I think if anybody had been listening to the Taoiseach on Morning Ireland on, I think, Tuesday morning when he had arrived in Glasgow, um, it was quite extraordinary the kind of language he gave. So in the past, Ireland has always framed 
its contributions more in, in, in line with its uh, relationships with uh, least developed countries and its overseas aid program and its commitment to cooperation through the European Union and the, the whole international regime that would always be very reluctant to be drawn on specifics, except that we, we do our bit. This time, the Taoiseach was going to the COP with um, much more um, convincing climate uh, policy and regime under his arm. And he, he came across as being quite confident that, that there was many opportunities associated with this, that we need to kind of um, sell this back to the Irish public uh, in terms of the potential for new jobs, green investment, protection of biodiversity. And for those of us who've been campaigning on issues related to agriculture over the last number of years, I know you have as well, Porik, this was music to our ears because he was finally framing the issue, not only in a positive light, but in a way that kind of um, sought to see the, the potential for climate action to bring about lots of other environmental and ecological and also social benefits. Um, but later that afternoon, um, it became very clear well, in, in fact, uh, a subsequent follow up question made it clear that there wasn't really going to be any change of position. It was a change of um, uh, narrative, change of rhetoric, but it wasn't really a change of the fundamental position. So Ireland was not bringing anything new. Ireland was willing to sign up to the global pledge to reduce methane emissions by 30%, but the Taoiseach made it absolutely clear that Ireland wasn't going to do 30% worth of methane reductions. And um, so a figure has been bandied around now that in the Climate Action Plan, we're likely to see a methane target of 10%. And I just might address that question as well that came up because it's related. So the methane separate target for methane is something seen as a kind of a, a precious win for the agricultural lobby. Um, it, it, it's something they've argued for on the grounds that methane is somehow different, special, that it breaks down more quickly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, John and others have highlighted over and over and over again, the importance of sticking to the um, IPCC and the UNFCCC accounting systems that recognize how potent methane is as a gas. So it has a very uh, pronounced warming effect on the atmosphere. And the science is more and more clear now from the latest reports that reductions in methane help us to, I suppose, build some resilience and build some time in terms of what we need to do with fossil uh, gases, uh, CO2 and others. Now, if Ireland only reduces our methane emissions by 10%, given the huge share of agriculture in our overall emissions profile, um, Hannah Daly has calculated that that would um, require 65 odd percent emission reductions from mostly the energy system. Now that covers heating, transport, but power generation and also some um, nitrous oxide. And, you know, we have to question whether or not that's actually feasible by 2030. 64 percent reductions by um, 2030 of all the non-methane gases is really terribly onerous. And there is some doubt already about whether we can stick within the carbon budgets that the Climate Change Advisory Council ha has recommended. So to, to conclude, I would say I'm very disappointed. I think we were, we were sold a pup by the, the, by the Taoiseach's flowery language on Tuesday morning. And by Tuesday evening, it was quite clear that very little give is evident of the Irish position. And um, I think there's a lot of progress that's been made. There's no question about um, lots of progress has been made. But until we address this thorny issue of agricultural emissions and set targets that require the agricultural sector to do its fair share of emission reduction, um, I, I think it's increasingly doubtful that we'll be able to meet our targets and stay within budget. But secondly, that we'll be able to do it in anything like a fair manner because of the distributive effects on, on um, all those other areas that we all interact with, transport, energy, heating, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a complex area, it's politically fraught, but we're not doing ourselves any favours by not addressing it. And just to, to, to clarify, Sai, because um, there's been a lot of talk, I've heard the, the new head of Chagas talk about, you know, new technologies or new genomics and feeding <laughs> cattle seaweed and so on. I mean, are these, uh, you know, is, is, there, is there any potential in those routes or, or, because it, or is it really just down to the numbers of, of animals? Well, for, for any given set of emission reductions you might want to uh, impose, 
you usually have a range of options. You have the kind of low hanging fruit options, the cheapest things to do or the things that make sense to do first. And the Chagas have been setting out what they consider to be the lowest hanging fruit for 10 years, and none of them have been implemented. And the reason for that is not that Chagas are necessarily wrong, although they might be wrong. It's just that um, the way they model these um, options um, uh, assumes that farmers will take up the measures, that just because it might save money somewhere that a farmer will automatically do it. And the reality is that some of the, some of the measures um, have had very little take up. Some um, aren't in the farmer's immediate interest to do that, depending on what their, their own business model is. And really the overriding uh, bus business agenda and model is, is one of expansion. And there isn't really anything to stop farmers expanding in the current regime. And I've been thinking just in the last few days, given the, the absence of any effective policy measures, the eco schemes aren't going to do it. Um, it looks like the climate targets aren't going to do it. And I think we're going to have to start looking at Ireland's nitrate de derogation as the only way to actually lower the stocking densities and manage the kind of rapid increase in herd numbers. I can't quite remember, and somebody else will, but I think in the past year, I think there's 114,000 extra dairy cows in the herd. Now, it's not our herd, it belongs to the farmers, but that's an awful lot of extra cattle. And the more cattle you add, and the more of the uh, uh, overall herd that is dairy rather than beef, um, there's a clear correlation there with increased greenhouse gas emissions and pressures on water quality and biodiversity as well. So we just have to, we have to address it. And I, I don't see the political and the policy system being um, responsive to these issues, regardless of the clamoring from the EPA and environmental NGOs, and also the likes of, of John Sweeney and Natashka, who've been, who've been you know, making this point for over 10 years, including at all of the COPs as civil society representatives. Yeah, John, uh, do you want to uh, come in there and talk a little bit about the agriculture side of things? Well, I, I don't think I could, could put it better than Saif has just put it. I mean, she expresses it beautifully. And really, the conclusion I've come to is a great deal of sympathy for our farmers because they are being used as pawns um, by large agro-food industries primarily. Um, and farmers have been so badly led in the past 10 years. They've been led into a cul-de-sac. To me, they're rather like lemmings at the moment. They're gradually being led over a cliff. And that cliff has been obvious for the past five to 10 years. And I think, you know, th there is no easy solution to this. Um, th 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 things are coming down the line legally. Um, for agriculture, which will be the ultimate thing which can effect change quicker than all of the pressure groups and all of the lobby groups um, over time can. Um, the nitrate derogation is a totem. I would love to see uh, an attempt made to try and question whether that should be renewed or not. But, you know, when you talk to Chagas, when you talk to uh, agriculturalists, oh, there's no question of us not getting a renewal of the nitrates derogation. Um, the problem with intensification is not simply the fact that we have more cows, but it's also the fact that we're putting more in the way of inputs into those cows from heavily fertilizing this, um, this alien species called perennial ryegrass all the time. And uh, therefore methane output per cow has gone up substantially, but up by about 10 or 20 percent um, over the past 20 years. So, you know, the consequences are we won't even go into what it's doing to river water quality, what it's doing to lake quality, what it's doing to ammonia emissions. All of these things um, have been known and are known about. Um, and I think what, you know, the discussion that we've seen this week kind of exemplifies the fact that there is an agenda internationally uh, and there is an agenda domestically, and the two do not interact. Um, the, the domestic agenda is set by the pressure groups. Um, the international agenda, you pay lip service to if you have to. And I think the Taoiseach's comments about, you know, um, we're not going to be bound by the 30% reduction we signed up to, 
it's a bit hypocritical, to be honest, um, if you want to put it as bluntly as that. But it's an indication of the fact as well that we do not see uh, a plan as something that we actually are determined to achieve. We see a plan as something that we can peddle internationally uh, and we can extol the virtues of Origin Green or Board Bia or whatever, uh, but we don't actually have to come to terms with, with tackling the problem at the grassroots level. Um, I, I was going to go back to what Siobhan was saying because um, there was a very interesting thing happened at Paris. Um, we all stood around on the last day waiting for the Paris Agreement to be actually issued in text format. And it was delayed, it was delayed, it was delayed. And we were told it was translation difficulties. And then we were told, no, they were still wrangling over loss and damage. And uh, it was the United States that didn't want to include loss and damage in the final text in any shape or form. And finally, it was included um, as, as a, a small part of the final text, but under the proviso that there would be no financial implications involved. And that could have negated it all anyway. And, you know, I think we're seeing, uh, I think the developing countries uh, having lost trust in the developed world to come up with the goods to enable them to, to finance a sustainable future. We're seeing the developed countries having lost trust in the ability of the developing countries to spend money wisely. So you're getting comments from uh, people like the United States talking about monitoring, uh, reporting, verification, uh, about not giving money directly to governments and so on. And that's, there's an element of that coming out a little with the Irish government's aid policy as well. Um, so, you know, I think there is a breakdown in trust between the two sectors. And that breakdown in trust is, is you can translate it right back to the domestic level as well. Um, you know, we, we have, there's a, a loss of trust between our policy makers, um, our, our farmers, um, and even I think within the farming sector now, there is beginning to see, we're beginning to see a split between the dairy farmers, the intensive dairy farmers and the beef farmers. Uh, and beef farmers in particular are now beginning to realize that they may be the sacrificial lambs for literally uh, the sacrificial lambs for the intensive industry to enable it to, to progress and intensify even further. So I can see uh, I, can, I can see contention developing within the community. I can see urban rural uh, divisions also materializing from people who say, well, we pay car tax, we pay our carbon tax. Um, you know, why should all of the carbon tax go to a, a sector which has subsidized fuel and which is not willing to change? So, you know, th th that kind of conflict is going to emerge down the road, unfortunately, uh, unless it's very carefully handled. And um, we haven't seen signs of that happening this week at all. Indeed, um, and just there was a, there was a comment there in the chat about the uh, the farmers uh, who are rising to the to the climate and biodiversity challenge, and and uh, the, the comment asked, could we give them a mention? And and I think that is appropriate. Um, I was in the Burren uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we got some very good presentations from farmers who are taking this seriously, um, have come up with their own schemes on their own farms uh, to address the problem and are exceeding some of the targets that we have uh, seen in the cap and in the EU farm to fork strategy. Uh, you know, they, they look at some of these targets and go, sure, they're not even ambitious. We have done all these things uh, without um, uh, you know, without any help from the government, essentially, or without, you know, any, any policy changes. So um, I think all of this stuff is, is much more doable than is being made out uh, in, in some quarters. Uh, and, and I think it is just important to acknowledge the farmers that are that are doing yeah. that. And my um, hero is my hero is Brendan Dunford. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, and you and, and for many others as well. But we yeah, we, yeah. we see other farmers now really finding their voice uh, in this area and and uh, and engaging with it. And I think that's that's a really uh, positive thing to see. Um, Dermot, I'm going to go go back to you because you're you're. Uh, you're in a kind of a legal part of your your the the course that you teach in in DCU, and maybe I was going to ask you specifically about the the Ireland's new climate act and the 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 targets that are in that about fifty one percent. 
I'm coming from, uh, you know, I've been, I've been campaigning in, in the area of kind of biodiversity mostly, but also water for the past 20 years. And I've seen so many laws pile up on all of these different things, whether it's protecting endangered species and meeting water quality targets, and they've all been completely ignored. Can you tell me why we should have faith that the Climate Act is going to be any different? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, Porik, I'm going to be able to provide quite the reassurance that you're, uh, you're, you're hoping for, um, because I, I've, you know, I've made this point before in respect of the, of the climate law. Governments or governments break the law all the time, not just the Irish government, governments around the world um, break, break the law um, uh, in, in various respects. Um, so, so really what the, what the climate law does is um, it, 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 you know, it, it sets in place uh, a process for, for laying down carbon budgets um, and you know, technically the 51% by 2030 target, it's it's not quite enshrined in law because it's only the 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 requirement is only that the advisory council has to recommend a carbon budget consistent with with that, and the government could depart from that. I think it's it's very unlikely that that it would do so, but but it, it sets the the law sets in place a, a process for 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 target setting, and then for accountability. And um, but the the accountability. Mechani the primary accountability mechanism set out in, in the law is, is political, it's, it's not legal. It's not that there will be hard sanctions um, in, in the case of, of, of non-compliance. Um, and Ireland isn't, Ireland's climate law is not uh, unique in that respect. Most climate laws uh, take, take that form. We, we will have um, uh, compliance costs under the EU climate and energy framework if we if we don't meet our 2030 uh, targets. But but the primary mechanism for for accountability is is political, and that's to say that the government will be shown to be um, will will be shown to you know be be not complying with with the, with its targets. But but there are also a number of mechanisms built into the law. Um, that, if you like, kind of anticipate <coughs> uh, and, and anticipate that non-compliance, that kind of after the fact non-compliance is not meeting targets. So, you know, the, there are various provisions in the law about what um, what the climate action plan and uh, and the the long term strategy must contain, or, or what what kinds of things they must contain, what they they must do in order to be compliant with the. With the um, with the overall law, so you know they, they have to be um, uh, consistent with the carbon budget. So they have to set out a, a um, you know a, a set of policies and measures that um, can plausibly be shown to to achieve um, or you know, to, to 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 plausibly uh, achieve the the carbon budgets. Um, they also need to be the, the climate action plan, and the long term strategy needs need to be compliant with the. Uh, Ireland's in EU and international obligations, and and if you know, if a climate action plan was manifestly not complying with with those, then as it, as happened in the case of the the climate case, um, climate case Ireland, uh, the government could be you know, brought before the courts and told to write uh, an, a new a new plan. Um, that you know, that's as far. Uh, as 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 it goes, but if if a government really doesn't want to um, you know reduce emissions, if if a government really finds it politically uh, unpalatable to to reduce uh, uh, emissions, a government can choose not 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 to do so. And ultimately, our our our, our sanction is at the ballot box, right? That's you know we we have the choice collectively to to kick out. Um, a, 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 yeah, a government at, at the at the next election. Yeah, we've seen, uh, you know, kind of in the history of the Irish environmental movement, litigation has been really important. Um, but at the same time, it's really not ideal. You know, you see, you know, the, the shutting down of peat extraction and difficulties at forestry at the moment. And all of these have revolved around litigation. But um you know, it's it's you know it, it's really not ideal. It, it creates an awful lot of social tension, and you know we find that the government just really just doubles its 
effort to try and get around what is being asked of them. But uh, but I suppose litigation is still a very important uh, tool, I imagine you would say, uh, in holding the government to account. Uh, yes, yes, L litigation is is uh, is important. Um, but you know, it, uh, as as it, you know, I, I think the the climate case was particularly interesting because it wasn't just a court case. You know, it was a court case with a whole kind of program of of activism and, and mobilization uh, a, a, around it. And you know, so so I think litigation can be brought. To, you know, I think climate case Ireland showed us that litigation can be brought together with you know, a, a broader based um, mobilization and Saiv was, was very involved in, in, in that. Yeah. 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 Can I just add something as well? Go ahead. Because it's not just governments, it's also litigation against corporations. And increasingly um, with kind of the sort of climate reporting, voluntary but important nonetheless obligations that companies are taking on themselves, they're exposing themselves to greater financial risk and, and liability for um, damages essentially from their act activities. So I think it's not just about states, it's also about corporations. And we need to keep uh, 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 our eyes on a lot of the cases that are springing up around the world. Um, they do take a lot of time to go through the courts, um, but there's some very exciting prospects. It depends on the jurisdiction and the argument and the company and the state and so on and so forth. They're all different, but, um, but, but there's been a flood of them in recent years and I don't see that subsiding anytime soon. Yeah. But, but litigation also is a David and Goliath situation for NGOs. Um, you know, one case that goes wrong in the high court will bankrupt an NGO for good. So, you know, you have to be very, very careful about litigation. Um, it's, it would be nice if, it, if the playing field was level. But when you're facing the, the giant corporation or when you're facing all of the defences of the state, then you know you are in a very sticky wicket, uh, and for an NGO, that that that's something that has to be considered very carefully, in terms of long-term sustainability. Yes, you know all about that in Antashka uh, at the moment. Um, thanks for that, John. And T Tad, I'm going to go to you, please. Um, one of the things that uh, has struck me so far as I have walked around the various pavilions uh, here is that the the, I, the, the problem of consumption just doesn't feature, you know, the, 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 the idea that we have to reduce our consumption is, is not featuring at any of the talks that I, that I have seen. And it just seems to be bizarre because uh, I've, evidently a lot of our, our problems are coming back to just uh, the, the, the rate of consumption waste that we're, we're producing. Um, maybe could you talk a little bit about that or what, what can be done? And I know uh, the, the government has brought in some legislative uh, measures to uh, reduce that. Yeah, and I suppose kind of to mirror some of uh, Jeremy's conversation there about the Climate Act with the, with the circular economy bill at the moment, that's kind of going through at the moment, it's kind of, I suppose we would find that within that language at the moment, it's quite vague. And so we'd really be pushing for statutory targets to be put into that, to kind of really have targets around material use and kind of across, um, uh, across different sec sectors of kind of the economy and sector of society so that Kind of everyone is kind of working towards uh, better material use um, and I suppose as well to mirror some of um, some of the earlier comments as well around the importance of holding corporations to account as well voice are part of um, break free from plastic which is an international movement and through through the summer they hold the international brand audit and this is litter pickers from across the world going out doing litter picking and identifying the brands that they are finding on their litter picks and just kind of giving a global picture of litter and who is producing it. And it's the same companies consistently coming up in these, in these uh, global brand audits, but they also giving very different messages in different markets, depending on, um, depending on the mores of the particular uh, jurisdictions that they're in. So, you know, where we might hear a lot of good talk about recyclability in say, in Europe, the same company in, the US or in Southeast Asia might be pushing a very different agenda and might be kind of pursuing a very different idea in that, context, in that context. And I think it's really important that where we see these corporations putting up these big kind of, you know, talks of 
you know, recyclability and kind of these things that we kind of, we do kind of hold them to account as well and kind of pull that, pull those threads together that way as well. How do you, uh, how do we, how do we sell the message to people that maybe we need to not buy all the stuff in the shop and, you know, if you just scale back, is that, is that possible or, or will that have to happen through um, price rises uh, for certain com uh, well, commodities? I think like, I suppose our experience would be primarily within the Irish context, at least. And I suppose one of the big things is supporting alternative ways. You know, we would have a phrase internally about uh, buy the product, not the packaging. And that's, you know, so that's kind of supporting reuse and uh, reuse systems. And there's an awful lot of issues around those within, certainly within the Irish kind of system at the moment, particularly around kind of liability and um, health and safety issues around reuse and kind of clear, clarifying those would, be, would make huge steps for, we have an example of a company in Mead, I think it is, that's trying to sell kind of, or trying to sell milk in bottles that you can reuse. And they've been kind of effectively told that no, you can't do that within Ireland at the moment. And so, you know, that's kind of quite a simple, they're actively told, no, go back to single use plastic bottles. So just on, just to take that one very small example, that's a very quick switch for consumers. It's functionally no difference for a consumer, but it makes a massive difference in terms of the material that we're putting out onto the market. So I think there needs to be a lot more um, kind of cross, talk across areas, both like within government and with, with industry as well, and with industry bodies and advisory bodies. I think there's a lot of that that can happen that doesn't massively affect the consumer. Ultimately, it will change roughly how we, how we buy a product, but it doesn't necessarily change, make things more expensive or less expensive in that context. Yeah, and I suppose what you're saying is that there's there's a lot that could be done to make it easier on uh, oh, sure. on, on Joe Soap going into the supermarket. Yeah, oh, yeah. For sure, yeah. Um, so there look, a, like, and there are there are initiatives kind of both in Ireland and internationally that are showing that these these contexts and these approaches can be can be well can be kind of designed and used. We've seen it in Ireland with the Conscious Cup campaign, kind of making huge impacts in terms of the just just one one item of reusable cups. Um, we've kind of there's kind of a few other programs around the place. There's repaint is kind of one you reusing paint. There's kind of lots of different programs that are kind of coming out now that show alternative ways of using material. And I think we just kind of need to really support those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So th thanks for that, Ted. So look, uh, thanks very much for everybody. I, th we have a couple of questions. So if you're willing to stay on for a few minutes, I know some of you may have to head off. Uh, but uh, if you're willing to stay on for another 10 minutes or so, uh, maybe I could throw out a few questions uh, at, at, uh, at people. Um, uh, or if any of you have any questions. Uh, burning points that you'd, you'd like to add. Um, Liam asked, and maybe this is a question for, I don't, I don't know, I'll let anybody answer it who wants to answer it, but uh, um, could somebody comment on the issue of airline and shipping emissions? Uh, and this is military related emissions. And I think this is this is from Liam and it's, I think it's because these these emissions are not counted. Uh, is that correct? And could you, yeah. could you could somebody clarify that? Yeah, it's a little known fact that uh, none of the reporting mechanisms under the UNFCCC don't uh, they don't include military emissions. Um, now it's not a big contributor for the likes of Ireland, but it will be for other countries. Uh, they may partly be be uh, counted in terms of consumption of oil, but I, I have a feeling they're not, um, and that they're left out which is something to think about. It truly is. And I mean, is that going to change? I mean, is that, are those kind of things under discussion at COP? No, I, I think uh, they, they don't come up because no country is willing to give away its secrets in this area. They're not willing to say how much oil or gas they consume uh, for their military purposes. But say for, for, for shipping and, and aviation? Well, shipping and aviation are very different. I mean, the International um, the Maritime Organization and the International Aviation Organization have both stalled badly for the past 10 years on actually coming to grips with any kind of uh, uh, contribution to the Paris Agreement. Um, we, we've got promises out of them that they're going to be um, more carbon efficient, 
but in terms of actual reductions, both of them have been really quite disappointing. Um, the problem, of course, is that the, those emissions occur in international waters or international airspace. So which country do you attribute them to has always been the difficulty. The European Union have made strong efforts to include aviation emissions in, uh, in, in aircraft flying from Europe, as far as I'm aware. But it's a very small part of the overall global story. I mean, Europe now contributes something like 7% of total global emissions. And that's something that at COP you really begin to get conscious of. We are very small in the bigger picture. And uh, within that, therefore, the contribution that we make, even if we manage to get aviation and shipping emissions counted more rigorously, as long as the big boys don't play um, part in that, then you know it's not going to make a big indentation in the problem overall. I guess there there is a kind of a, an issue of social justice here um, about you know the uh, you know farmers will say you know they're they're being asked to change their entire livelihoods while people are taking shopping weekends to to New York, uh, and even anybody who <laughs> who who has travelled to Scotland uh, by surface transport will know that it's not only longer it's a lot more expensive than than flying, which really seems insane. But uh, dear Mid sorry, you have your hand up there. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to come come in on this and and maybe just follow up to what John was saying. So <clears throat> I, I don't know the, the history in detail, but yes, I I think as John explained the kind of the the, the rationale for how avi- international and avi- aviation and shipping emissions are counted is that our emissions accounting is <clears throat> on a production basis. Per, per country and so international aviation and shipping are genuinely quite tricky to fit into that accounting system that, that accounts emissions because you know you for for each flight or um uh you know or, or um uh shipping journey you 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 would need to figure out what proportion of of the total to to allocate to, to different countries so so the the there is um, you know, so I think that's the the explanation for why they're they're excluded, and and the the arrangement. I, I think it goes back as far as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, which was was to say that um, the international the intergovernmental forums for aviation and shipping are the appropriate forums to deal with these issues. The problem with that is that those are industry driven. I mean that they are, you know, formally intergovernmental negotiations in in that countries are recommend are represented by by their their national governments. But it's, you know, I, I think it's a pretty severe case of industry capture, uh, yeah, industry capture of of government, you know, around the world that the the government negotiators. So so firstly, the 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 industries are are very closely tied into the negotiations but also it's the the transport ministries uh, I, I think generally are the ones representing um the 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 the, the, the national their national positions and, and they are you know very much in captured by by the relevant in, industries indeed and, but what about um putting a carbon tax on aviation fuel is that something that would uh, be of any value um uh, so I, I I don't know is that a question for me. I, it is I can, if you can I can answer have a, have a stab at that. <laughs> yes. So 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 you know that that's the the, the standard economists' uh, answer to you know to to a problem of pollution is to to put a price on on carbon and and at the aggregate level that um, that certainly makes sense and it's likely to drive an aggregate reduction in in demand. But what what's likely to happen under the surface? Is that um, the, the 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 family who can just about afford one holiday a year are priced out of taking that that you know that that international flight, whereas the frequent flyer businessman or woman um, who flies you know once or twice a month or possibly more um, can absorb the the you know, the incremental cost Im- imposed by the carbon tax so so the distributional effect of a carbon tax is likely to be that you <laughs> you 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 price out the people who are flying the least uh, and and the people who continue to fly are, are those who are flying the most so it's it, it's it's tricky you know and and 
An alternative approach would be to have a, you know, a, a, a kind of an elevator tax, you know, a tax that increases the more times you, you fly, or simply to have a rationing system. But you know, our our our, our, our policy-making systems aren't well set up to, to to you know, and our administrative systems aren't well set up to to implement those those kinds of measures. Mm, indeed. Uh, Siobhan, maybe I'll, I'll come to you because, you know, the, the issues maybe we're talking about are to do with you know, climate justice and f- fairness. And there's a question here from Caroline about how the rise of energy prices, carbon taxes is likely to have a negative impact on keeping civil society on board. I mean, I know you deal mostly with uh, people in the in the developing world, but at the same time, there is also this sense that people who maybe are contributing the least are are have have been forced then to bear an un an unfair uh, share of the burden, uh, and how how can we in Ireland uh, maybe address that? Do you think, or or do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, yeah. Although we we focus more globally on thinking about as as was speaking about earlier, the people who are experiencing the worst impacts of climate change right now in, in developing countries. But I, I mean, I think the same principles that we're advocating for globally need to be applied nationally as well. And so that's human rights, um, equity, fairness. Uh, and so I think these are these are crucial. And um, maybe, you know, if, if in, in terms of, you know, addressing the challenge um, people need to feel that there is fairness underpinning it and human rights are, are really key. Um, and maybe like diverging a bit from, from Ireland, I mean, I thought it was really interesting yesterday here, Global Witness had um, a display and they had a list of all the names of environmental um, and land defenders who have been murdered in the last year. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the reality of, you know, people, um, in countries across the world um, are trying to challenge actually a lot of times corporate uh, injustice um, and trying to protect the environment in which they live and their communities and they're being killed and targeted for it and um, you know so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a few different points not very coherently but I suppose my overall human rights need to be central to climate action and climate justice and we can't achieve what we need to achieve without human rights being being central to it and that applies in Ireland it applies globally um, and I think you know we really need to um, think from that lens particularly when we look to the transition that we that we need to make um, if you look at renewables now the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre have just released a report where they're documenting the number of attacks against defenders in the context of renewable energy projects. Um, so as we make the, the transition, um, if we don't protect human rights and put it put them first, um, we're not going to get to where we need to be. And that, that certainly applies in Ireland as well. Um, and I think a just um, and fair approach is the only way that everybody will feel and will act accordingly. Yeah, I, absolutely, and I think it's a very uh, it's a very sensitive subject, but it's very it's something that that environmental groups in Ireland would would do very well to listen carefully to, particularly when it comes to renewable energy infrastructure and how it affects uh, local communities and so on. I think it's a, I don't think we have got that uh, that balance right yet. Um, but uh, lastly, uh, our last question for this evening, I'm going to put to you, Tad, and um, um, it's from Niall, and he talks about, you know, how do you think the lack of media coverage and civil society knowledge in Ireland about the impacts that are already being experienced um, can, can be addressed? And maybe, you know, in terms of what, what you're trying to achieve in, in voice, you know, I mean, are you, are you seeing the right kinds of media articles uh, about the things that we're trying to get at? I suppose from a, from the voice point of view, we've kind of seen uh, an increase in interest in, I guess, the kind of the, the waste area over the last kind of three, four years. And I think climate and environment in general has kind of really been picking up. And I think kind of the panel that kind of touched on it earlier, that particularly in the run up to COP as well, it really ramped up um, in terms of the media interest in environmental stories. And we've kind of seen quite a change in how climate particularly is being covered um, on news media in general. 
And I think even on a local level, like say we would be running projects in communities across across Ireland, you know. So we have been we have found ourselves more writing pieces for kind of more local papers and local kind of newsletters and things like that a lot more of late as well, which I think is a really interesting development and it kind of shows a kind of more kind of grassroots engagement on these issues, I think anyway. Yeah, very good. And I think maybe we don't all agree that the uh, the level of media attention has been has been good. But um, in the in the past, it, it, the tide tends to go out again uh, a few weeks later. So we we have to uh, hope that uh, that that, uh, that that it will maintain uh, that level of media uh, that media attention. And that also, I think that we get deeper into the issues. You know, I mean, so many of the the media articles I see are really just quite superficial, and we're not really getting at the at the heart of the matter but um but uh, but but there are maybe reasons for for believing that that things are changing um and with that maybe i will just uh, draw the evening to a close and uh, and i want to thank you all uh, tad and dermot siobhan and and john and, and Saif, who's left us um not only for attending uh our webinar, but also for coming to Glasgow and uh, bringing your expertise and your energy uh, to to the to the event. Um, I think it's so much uh, it's it's so it's so important um, that you know people do not feel a sense of despair uh, amid all the awful headlines uh, and, and disempowerment. And uh, and I think the the number of, of NGOs and activists and academics who are coming here to Scotland, uh, not only from Ireland but around the world. Um, uh, really gives us some cause for, uh, for dare I say it, hope. Um, but of course, hope hope is really important. And thank you all uh, to those of you at home who uh, who have tuned in. And I hope uh, you continue to tune in to, to the other events uh, throughout COP uh, this week and, and next week. Uh, this event has been recorded, so it will be on our website uh, in a couple of days if you want to share it with, with other people or watch back again. And lastly, as I always say, you know, if you uh, like what we do here in the Irish Wildlife Trust, please do subscribe and become a member and help us uh, in our work. We're trying to fly the flag for biodiversity. We didn't talk very much about biodiversity this evening, but uh, but anybody who's been following me on Twitter is probably sick of me going on about biodiversity. So maybe that was a, a welcome break for you all. Okay, so thanks once again, everybody, and good night from Glasgow. Good night, all. Thank you.